Um, okay. Um, great. It is, it is so wonderful to have you all here with us today for what will be a great and informative presentation and discussion. Um, my name is Stephanie Foner and I work in the Office of Alumni Relations at Northeastern on our domestic engagement team, which means I bring events and programs um, to alumni across the country. Typically those events happen in person, but recently we have all been virtual. Um, so first, just a couple of housekeeping items. Please keep your microphone on mute to ensure that we have a good sound quality through the presentation. Oh, sorry, while well, I also manage our waiting room. Um, great. Um, so if you have any questions, you can utilize the chat box. I'll be keeping a close eye on it. Um, secondly, I recommend you put your view onto speaker view rather than gallery view. While Professor Modestino will be sharing her screen, as you can see right now, so you can see her slides, once we transition into the Q&A, uh, you'll definitely want to be able to have your view focused on, um, on her screen so you can watch her speak and answer any questions. Um, and then lastly, uh, Professor Modestino will be speaking for about 20 minutes and then there will be time for Q&A at the end. Again, please use the chat box. During that time, I will be reading out any questions you may have. Um, we have an hour set aside for the session and we will not go over that time limit. Um, but if we don't reach an hour, that's, that's okay. And I'm happy to give you back some of this sunny, sunny Friday. Well, it's, it's um, sunny here in Boston anyway. Um, so now I'm excited to introduce to you our presenter today, Professor Alicia Modestino. Um, professor Modestino is an associate professor with appointments in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs and the Department of Economics at Northeastern University. Since 2015, Dr. Modestino has also served as the Associate Director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy. Dr. Modestino's current research focuses on labor and health economics, including changing skill requirements, youth development, healthcare, housing, and migration. And with that, I am happy to turn it over to Professor Modestino. Great, thanks so much, Stephanie, and thanks for having me. Um, thanks for letting me share this research and also how this research has evolved in the wake of the pandemic and um, how my work with the city has evolved with that as well. Um, I did notice that one of uh, the folks who popped on the call, uh, Rachel Cedarberg, was a research assistant at one point on this project, and now Rachel has gotten her doctoral wings and flown uh, from Northeastern to uh, now become um, an economist at Burning Glass Technologies, uh, working with uh, all sorts of other exciting data. But just want to acknowledge that uh, she played a large role in a lot of the data that you're gonna see here. So let me just um, set the stage with the current situation of what the unemployment rate looks like uh, for the entire economy, as well as for the youth population. So. This um, chart is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It shows you the unemployment rate for all US civilians, so it excludes military folks. And the green line is youth age 16 to 19. The red line is um, all individuals combined. And you'll see, uh, obviously we've had a large spike in employment that was recorded in April due to the pandemic. So for the entire population, we have an unemployment rate of 14.7%. But you'll see that the unemployment rate for youth is much higher. In fact, it's um, double, more than double that rate at 31.9%. Now you notice the green line is always above the red line, right? So uh, young people always uh, have a higher unemployment rate. They're the least experienced. They're the last hired, the first fired. But also this gets exacerbated whenever we hit a recession, right? So those lines diverge even further. And that's what we're seeing right now. So this is a particularly time, dire time for youth trying to find a job, and especially in the summertime when youth are most likely to be looking for a job. Um, at the same time, uh, city and state governments are facing very steep budget shortfalls, 
as well as logistical hurdles to mounting their summer jobs programs this year. So typically Mayor Walsh um, pictured here goes out every March and April and kind of beats the drum uh, for employers to be joining the summer jobs program and to be employing youth through the summer jobs program. Um, he says here, we're all in this together. I'm asking private sector companies in Boston to join the city, already participating companies, nonprofits, community-based organizations to make a commitment to this year's program. It's good for our youth. It's good for the businesses who hire our talented young people and it's good for the city of Boston. Um, however, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, lots of cities are facing these large budget shortfalls. For example, in April, New York City, which typically employs 75,000 low-income youth, canceled their summer jobs program, um, much to the shock and dismay of community-based partners who have since been trying to work to reinstate that program, um, because that means that there's 75,000 youth who will not be meaningfully engaged uh, the summer, meaning that they'll be left to their own devices. Um, and if anyone here uh, has uh, parented a teenager, we know how dangerous that can be, just even from a personal perspective. Uh, but from a citywide perspective, um, that was one of the motivations for the summer job program, was to keep youth engaged in something productive. The other thing is that the summer jobs program is a large uh, cash transfer program. So that's something that's not very well known. But in Boston, half of our youth that we survey are paying some kind of household bill with their summer jobs wages. So they're paying rent, they're helping to pay a utility bill, or they're even just covering their own cell phone bill, like I would love my children to do. Um, so it's, it's not just a matter of keeping youth busy, but it's also a matter of supporting their families and keeping them out of poverty in the summer. So you might say, well, you know, that's all well and good. We could probably find other things for youth to do. But there's actually um, a large body of evidence that we've been contributing to about how these summer jobs programs contribute to youth outcomes. Um, and there's a variety of mechanisms that we've looked into. So one is just to boost employment through job readiness. So the old phrase of how do you get a job without ever having any experience, right, uh, is solved somewhat by the summer jobs program, right? So if you've had uh, a job through the program, then that means that you have uh, learned how to write a resume and a cover letter, you've learned how to interview, you've learned how to work in a setting with um, other adults, and you also have a supervisor who's willing to vouch for you to get your next job. We might also think that summer job programs are increasing academic achievements. Um, and, and this largely comes from the fact in Boston that we have a high, sec um, high percentage of these jobs that are in private sector companies, meaning um, working at State Street or Mass General Hospital or the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. And so for inner city kids from Roxbury and Dorchester, um, who probably have never been downtown, let alone in an office building downtown, this is quite a transformational experience and they're being mentored by and interacting with folks um, who largely have four-year college degrees, who have gone to um, very prestigious universities. And so in the work that we do, we actually find that this increases their aspirations from attending, say, community college uh, to a four-year college. And then the third is, um, there's actually a lot of social skills that you learn on the job that you don't learn in school. Um, so a lot of um, the relationships that you have with their job supervisor um, is one of the rare um, supporting relationships that they have with adults, aside from teachers or parents. Um, and it helps them develop a sense of agency and identity um, that comes with uh, having to show up to work every day, right? So uh, ironically, school doesn't really teach you that because kids uh, get written notes of excuses and things like that. There's not very many excuses you get to give in the summer jobs program. Um, if you are late to work, you know, two, three times, then you're likely to lose your job and that accountability is important. Um, the other thing is you learn things like self-efficacy and conflict resolution because they're working with other youth, with other adults in teams um, and that turns out to be a very different situation even than when you're on, say, a, a team project for school. So we've been engaged in a multi-year evaluation with the city of Boston to evaluate the summer jobs program since 2015. Uh, this has been funded by William T. Grant Foundation and our partner here is the Office of Workforce Development who oversees the program. Some of the goals are to look at both the short-term impacts, like what do youth learn during the summer as well as the longer term outcomes. So 
how does this improve, say, criminal justice outcomes, school outcomes, or employment outcomes in the one or two years after participating in the program? And not only do we want to know if the program has an effect, but we want to understand why, um, and also for whom, right? So the why question gets at, can we replicate it in other places or in other situations, right? So there's lots of things that come with the summer job program, including um, a career readiness curriculum. And if it's the case that that is the piece that's very impactful here, then we can replicate that in other settings and maybe get these same outcomes without having to match kids to jobs, which is a, a heavy lift every summer. We also want to know who is most benefiting from this program, because one of the goals uh, for Mayor Walsh is to reduce inequality across groups. And this really became highlighted this summer um, with the death of George Floyd um, and all of the issues around race and uh, socioeconomic status. This has always been a focus of the city, but Mayor Walsh uh, this summer, even though we were talking about how can we get summer jobs uh, to happen this summer, he felt like these issues that are coming um, to the fore right now make it really imperative that we continue this work. And then we also want to know more about these program features, right? So um, does it matter if you get a job with a state street versus a community-based organization or how impactful is that career readiness uh, curriculum or does it help that you participate in more than one summer or do you only get one summer and that's enough? And the reason why that question is important is because all of these programs are oversubscribed, meaning there's more youth who want a job than spots that are available. So right now the spots are assigned by lottery. So it's a random assignment, which is great for me as a researcher because I can study my treatment group relative to my control group and see what happens. Um, but not great for youth um, who are randomized out and put into the control group because they don't get a job. Um, so the city is very interested in knowing if you only need one summer experience to get these good impacts, then they want to make sure they limit the number of times you get to be in the program so they can serve as many youth as possible. So just to give you an idea of what the program looks like, um, all City of Boston residents age 14 to 24 can apply to the program. They work 25 hours a week for a six week period that begins right after July 4th through the middle of August. They are paid the Massachusetts minimum wage, so it's a pretty well paying gig. Um, they can be placed either in a subsidized position, like I mentioned with a nonprofit or community based organization. Typically that is in a summer daycare or day camp uh, situation, which as you can imagine right now during the pandemic, a lot of those camps are not running. So we've had to pivot the program um, or they can be placed with a private sector employer, as I mentioned. They also get 20 hours of additional training through this career readiness curriculum that was developed by the Commonwealth Corporation. Um, that includes all sorts of topics like workplace safety, you know, learning your strengths and your skills and interests, soft skills, etc. Um, and then finally, you can participate in multiple summers, um, at least for now, the way the programs run. So what we wanted to really look at was um, learning about these program mechanisms and features. And so what we're going to do is look at the short term impact of the program over the summer. What do kids learn? How are we going to find this out? We run a pre and a post survey, meaning you take a survey before they begin the program about their job readiness skills, their academic aspirations, um, their uh, community engagement and their soft skills. And then we survey them again at the end of the summer to see what changed over time. And we compare those responses for the treatment versus the control group. So right now we just deployed our survey on Monday and we're collecting this data this year. Um, then we use administrative data, uh, meaning uh, records that are collected by government agencies or schools to look at longer term outcomes. And here's where we're able to measure things like um, criminal justice outcomes using the arraignment records from the Department um, <coughs> of Justice and Information Services, academic outcomes using school records from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and employment outcomes using employment and wage records collected by the Division of Unemployment Assistance. And then what's really interesting is we link both those short term data, what do kids learn in the summer, to the longer term data of these um, long term criminal justice school and employment outcomes to find out how did we get these reductions in crime? How do we get improvements in high school graduation? How, what, what is it that is, is that youth are learning in the summer that lead to those better outcomes? And then we also look at how these uh, impacts uh, vary across different groups. So we look at um, age, gender, race, ethnicity, um, 
homelessness status, socioeconomic status, and other factors. So just to give you an idea, again, this is um, a randomized control trial, meaning that whether or not you get a spot in the program is assigned by chance, by a lottery. And so that lets us uh, take all of the applicants and divide them into what we call the treatment group. So that means you randomly got selected into the program versus the control group, meaning you did not. And because all of those youth applied, they all showed the same motivation to have a summer job. They're all similarly situated. That means we can just compare what happened to the treatment to the control group to determine the impact of the program. So we focus on youth that applied through one of the four intermediaries that run the summer jobs program. That intermediary is ABCD or Action for Boston Community Development. All of the data that you see here is going to be from the summer of 2015 when we first started our evaluation. Why does it all come from 2015? Because not only do youth have to experience the program, then you need enough time for them to experience outcomes, right? So you have to be able to look at them one year later, two years later, three years later to see if they graduated from high school, et cetera. You'll see that of the youth that applied, there were 1,186 who applied that were offered a job via random assignment. Um, that's uh, only 28% um, of individuals. 83.6% uh, accepted the job offer, which is a really important factor when you're studying a program, because let's say only 30% accepted the job offer. Well, then it's not a very effective or attractive program, right? So lots of uh, youth take it up during the summer. And then we show that um, the control group and the treatment group have very similar characteristics. They're similar in terms of age and gender and race and socioeconomic status. And then we also check to see, does the control group, uh, if they don't get a job through the summer job program, can they just go off and find their own job? And it turns out that only about a quarter of the youth in the control group can find their own job without this program. So again, that's really important because if it was the case that 80% could go find a job, then really this isn't a very impactful program right from the beginning. Um, and this is in summer 2015 when we only had an unemployment rate for youth of about 10%, not the 30% that we're seeing now. So if you ever thought the summer jobs program was going to be very impactful and essential, it would be a summer like this one. Okay, so let me show you some of the results from the research that we've done. So this comes from our survey data. Um, some of the first findings is just looking at um, how impactful is it to get a job through the summer job program versus a job on your own. So for that 25% of the control group that found their own job, it turns out that they actually worked fewer hours. So you'll see um, in that box that's highlighted the 21 to 25 hours there in that panel A, hours worked per week, you can see that the treatment respondents, the white bar, were much more likely to work 20 to 25 hours, 21 to 25 hours a week compared to the control respondents. Similarly, the treatment group was much more satisfied with their job experience. They were likely to consider a career in that type of work. They had someone they could use as a job reference. Um, and then in terms of the type of work, again, as I mentioned, a lot of these jobs are in daycare and day camps. Um, you also see some uh, office and administrative work, some outdoor maintenance work as well. But for the most part, they're experiencing sort of these community engagement type jobs. So one of the first things we looked at was um, changes in uh, social skills and community engagement for youth that participated in the program, what happened uh, before versus after participating in the program. So if for each bar here, you'll see the darker orange represents the share of youth who report, for example, always feeling they have a lot to contribute to the groups they belong to. Um, and then the lighter uh, orange color there shows you how many youth uh, reported uh, feeling that way post. So anytime that you see uh, these bars getting longer, then that means that there is an improvement in that measure. And we also break it down um, by gender, race, um, and age as well to show who is being most affected um, by, these, uh, by these type of short-term impacts that happen during the summer. So for example, in that first measure, um, feeling you have a lot to contribute to the groups that you belong to, you can see for Black and Hispanic youth, that change, so the light orange bar, is growing a lot more than it is for white or Asian youth. So again, it's having a bigger impact on Black and Hispanic youth. But we see these improvements across um, all sorts of community engagement um, type measures, feeling connected to the people in your neighborhood, as well as these um, uh, soft skills, like managing your emotions and your temper, knowing how to constructively resolve conflict with a peer. 
In terms of job readiness skills, we find really large improvements. Um, so the, the lighter color there that represents the post is much, much larger now for all sorts of job readiness skills like having a resume, searching for a job online, uh, developing answers to interview questions, practicing interviewing. And that's uh, very reassuring to us because the job readiness curriculum teaches this to them. So if we did not find an impact here, we would, we would really be worried. Um, and this really uh, matches up with what the intermediaries tell us they see over the course of the summer. And then finally, looking at their future plans and aspirations, we look at um, plans to work in the fall. Um, so actually, um, here you'll see uh, somewhat of an improvement uh, pre versus post, but this is one of the few measures where we don't see a significant difference to the control group. Um, and that's because a lot of these um, youth who work in the summer job program, your job ends at the end of the summer. And so they would have to go and find another job um, in the fall in order to be able to continue working compared to the control group that 25% who did find a job in the summer usually just rolls into the fall and keeps working. Um, we also saw uh, improvements in planning uh, to enroll in a, a four-year college. So a lot of this shift came from uh, youth who had planned to enroll in a two-year college now increasing their aspirations to attend a four-year college. So we know from the survey data that I just showed you that youth increase uh, their community engagement, their soft skills, they improve their job readiness skills, they uh, increase their academic aspirations. What does that do for some of these long-term outcomes that we can look at? The first thing that we looked at uh, was criminal justice outcomes. And so this is showing you the number of criminal arraign arraignments um, per youth. Arraignments are when you are not only arrested for a crime, but you are also brought before a judge where formal charges are made. So we don't have arrest data, which would probably show even more uh, frequency. Um, we have basically when you've been charged with the crime. And again, that doesn't mean that all of these crimes resulted in some kind of incarceration or anything like that, but it does show your involvement in the criminal justice system. And you can see in that left hand chart there that um, the treatment group uh, has a lower average number of arraignments uh, per youth compared to the control group after participating in the program. And that this is um, statistically significant. Uh, we look on the right hand side there. Uh, primarily for violent and property crimes. So we're seeing a 35% reduction in violent crime and a 29% reduction in property crime. And this matches up very well with what other researchers have found in other cities like Chicago, um, where they find roughly a 40% decline in violent crime uh, attributed to the program. So this is supporting that motivation for keeping kids off the streets, keeping them out of trouble. What's really interesting is that um, this is not just about keeping youth busy because these improvements occur over an 18 month period. So it's not just during the summer when you're keeping them busy that crime goes down. It continues to decline over the 12 to 18 month period. The other thing that we find um, uh, in terms of academic outcomes is that uh, youth improve their rate of high school graduation by about six percentage points. So whether or not they graduate on time um, as a senior or they graduate uh, ever, even if they graduate a little bit later, uh, the treatment group is much more likely to graduate from high school than the control group. Um, in the second panel here, you can also see they're much less likely to drop out. And these, um, these outcomes, you might say, well, how, did, how does the summer job program improve your likelihood of graduating from high school? So these outcomes are driven uh, first by improving your attendance. So in the year after participating in the summer jobs program, there's an increase of about two to 3% in terms of youth's attendance. So that makes that less likely that they're gonna drop out. It also improves um, their course performance. So they're much less likely to fail a course. So if you show up more often and you don't fail courses, it turns out you're not gonna drop out, and you're gonna graduate from high school. So the, the message on this slide is 90% of life is showing up and apparently you learn that from having a summer job more than just uh, from attending school. The other thing is we can link um, these outcomes back to our uh, summer job survey and show that it's largely driven by in improvements in work habits, so exactly showing up on time, as well as increases in academic aspirations. And then finally, we also looked at employment and wage outcomes. Um, so is it the case that youth who participate in the summer job program are more likely to work um, during the school year or in the following summer. It turns out this varies a lot depending on 
whether or not you are still a school-aged uh, youth who's still in high school versus if you are age 19 to 24 and you've already finished high school. So for school-aged youth, we actually don't find any increase in employment. And a lot of that has to do with you just had a summer job, so maybe now you don't have to work during the school year. There are lots of other competing um, priorities for your time in terms of academic work and extracurriculars. Um, but we do find for youth age 19 to 24 that employment and wages were higher during the year after participating in the summer job program relative to those in the control group. And again, this is linked back to those job readiness skills and also feeling um, like you are better prepared for a job and that you have a, a mentor that you can draw on from your summer job experience. Okay, so what's happening this summer? Um, so this summer is certainly a summer like no other. Uh, that is what uh, the city of Boston is calling this. Um, and in probably the end of March, we started having uh, regular weekly conference calls with all of these intermediaries who help place kids in job for the summer job program. So ABCD, the Boston PIC, uh, John Hancock's MLK Scholars, Youth Options Unlimited that involves support involved youth and youth employment and engagement. And we started to think about what can we do for the summer job program? Because at the time the mayor was very focused on reducing the number of caseloads, keeping people safe. Uh, but for us, for folks who work with youth in the summer, we were really worried that we would not have a summer job program this summer. So um, after several months of highlighting the research we had already done and the importance of summer jobs in improving criminal justice outcomes, academic outcomes, employment outcomes, we convinced the mayor's cabinet that the summer jobs program was important and essential for youth this summer and was something that they should consider investing in. And we brought to them four new tracks of how we would be able to do this uh, during the pandemic. And about two weeks ago, Mayor Walsh announced uh, that he would put an additional 4.1 million into the Boston Summer Jobs Program to support these four new tracks uh, to be able to safely engage youth in these meaningful activities this summer. So the first one is earn and learn. So we are uh, paying youth to take college courses. So not only is the cost of the college course uh, covered, but they will be earning wages um, while they are taking these courses for credit. And uh, we have 25 different courses across Bunker Hill Community College, Ben Franklin Institute, um, uh, I think Mass Bay College, uh, and one other community college that students can choose from, in addition to the um, Google Professional IT Certificate as well. Um, the second track is uh, virtual internships. So lots of companies like State Street or the Boston Fed that have large organizations where all of their employees are already working remotely. Um, when we came to them and said, we want you to still take youth for the summer, they said, we've got this. We got this all figured out. We know how to work remotely. But for other smaller companies, it was really a challenge. They were already having to cut staff. They didn't have staff that could supervise youth. They didn't know how they would keep youth busy this summer if they couldn't be in person and giving them you know, work on the fly at, as you would in, in an office environment. So. Um, to help support these companies uh, to be able to take their jobs online and not lose those positions. Um, it turned out uh, my colleagues here at Northeastern University um, in the College of Professional Studies have been working under an NSF grant to develop a platform that can be used. It's primarily been tested with community colleges, uh, but can also be used with high school students uh, to help facilitate these virtual internships. So it has these built-in projects like, you know, do a marketing plan or do a competitor analysis or develop a public health campaign, whatever the type of organization it is. And then it has this dashboard. So you can see when the youth are logging in. Um, you can set up, you know, deadlines for their projects. They can submit their work. They can, you know, submit uh, questions for feedback. Um, you can, you know, have team meetings and things like that. And we can track what's going on with youth over the summer. Because frankly, one of the biggest worries this summer is that we will pay youth to do these virtual types of things and they will stop logging in and run amok in the neighborhoods while we're still paying them. <laughs> okay, so there's a big concern about monitoring here. And the, the concern comes from the fact that uh, for Boston Public Schools, one in 20 kids stopped logging in entirely to the remote learning that was going on by the beginning of April. So this is certainly a, a big concern and I'm really glad that Northeastern could help and um, provide this tool um, to the city and the employers to use this. The third track was a, is a peer-to-peer COVID-19 campaign. Um, so uh, youth like to engage in peer-to-peer -peer types of activities. 
Um, and one of the things that we struggle with is um, trying to get young people to understand how serious the pandemic is and how to limit the spread of the disease, right? Not too many teenagers think it's really cool to wear a mask, um, but somehow our youth this summer are gonna work on that. They're gonna figure that out um, and also give out some good information. There's a lot of misinformation that's out there. A lot of the low income youth that we have live in immigrant communities where there's challenges in terms of English. And so not even understanding um, a lot of the regulations or the restrictions or the information about uh, the pandemic is a, a real challenge in these communities. And then finally, we really felt like we had to provide at least one in-person experience because kids are really tired of sitting in front of their computers with the remote learning and all of that. Um, and so some of you might remember the Red Shirts program um, that uh, used to be in effect in Boston maybe 20 years ago, uh, where youth would go around and do public works projects in parks and other recreational areas, um, whether it was picking up trash or uh, repainting or repairing uh, different facilities or landscaping, those kinds of things. So we brought this back as the Blue Shirts program uh, in a sort of COVID-19 refashioned uh, project. And so there will be youth in small groups under the supervision of someone from Public Works. They will practice social distancing. They will be provided uh, PPE to keep them and their families safe. But it's one of the few outdoor experiences that we could provide to youth this summer. So that's, uh, that's basically my, uh, all that I wanted to share today about the research that we had done um, on the summer jobs program to show its impact on youth, the partnership that we've had with the city of Boston, and then again, how we, we worked with city of Boston to help develop these four tracks um, to save the program. And now, you know, New York is looking at us uh, as, oh, maybe, maybe this is what we should be doing this summer. So I think that's kind of gratifying as well. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions about any any part of the presentation or other kinds of issues that might be on your minds. Great, thanks so much. Um, okay, so we have a question. Um, the charts seem to indicate not a big improvement in the ability to answer interview questions and the intention um, to attend four-year versus two-year colleges. Can you um, just reflect on that data a little bit and maybe um, explain a little bit further? Sure. So what I showed you guys in the charts, just to make it more visually appealing, was what you report before versus after the program. Um, and so we see small improvements <clears throat> in attending um, a four-year college and small improvements um, in interviewing uh, with an adult. But what we really are concerned with in terms of program impact is to compare those responses to what the control group says at the end of the summer, right? Because that tells us whether or not um, it's an impact from the program. And it turns out when you do that, um, there's a much larger improvement uh, that is shown when you compare the treatment to the control group. So the way we define our impacts is, did this actually improve for youth during the summer that we're in the program? And then is it statistically significantly different from what the control group experiences? And one reason why that's important is because um, youth are still developing, so we, we hope, right? And so they're still learning stuff over time. And it could be the case that youth are gonna learn how to interview uh, with adults on their own over the summer in some way, shape or form. Or maybe um, all youth are going to, um, you know, as they mature over the summer, start thinking about college and they think more about four-year versus two-year college. It actually turns out that there's a lot of uh, learning loss that happens during the summer um, and even loss in terms of academic aspirations that's usually um, called summer melt. And so even though we just find these tiny sort of improvements in these things for our treatment group, it turns out that the control group actually loses ground during the summer for those kinds of skills. So interviewing skills as well as um, their their academic aspirations to attend college. And so that's why some of what the summer jobs program is doing is preventive, where it's, it's preventing learning loss or skill deficits over the summer um, and preserving uh, those levels or even improving them uh, slightly over the summer so that kids have a better starting point in the fall. Great, thank you. Any other questions?
So not to pivot, um, but Professor Modestino and I um, connected yesterday and she shared with me some really interesting research that um, I guess is tangentially related um, as it involves um, youth in that they will be returning back to school. And I'm wondering if um, you could share a little bit about research in kind of another aspect of, of the work that you're working on. Oh, sure. Um, so another project that I'm working on is, um, and, and actually it's a project that quite a few faculty members from the School of Public Policy are involved in, is to help advise FEMA how to distribute dollars um, in disaster relief to communities to be able to rebuild their economy and reopen uh, and restart economic activity. So most people think about FEMA as disaster relief, um, you know, hurricanes or other natural disasters where you have to provide water, food, shelter. Um, but it's interesting, uh, President Trump declared all of each of the states a disaster area because of the pandemic. And it's not clear if he quite understood the um, implications of that in terms of funding. But what it does just by that declaration is it automatically, without congressional approval, releases um, a certain amount of disaster relief to every one of the states. And so one of the things we're working on is to help FEMA think about what are, where are the places where that aid is gonna be most effective. And so what, there's two areas that touch on this. One is K through 12, um, to be able to get schools to reopen. You'll note that um, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education just came out with new guidelines yesterday, where looks like we can be in person in schools. Uh, youth have to wear a mask, but they only have to be three feet apart to follow World Health Organization measures, not six feet apart. And um, that has been a struggle. But also um, the other piece of it that I'm working on is childcare. And so where some of that comes into play here is a, a lot of the pivoting that had to happen for the summer jobs program was that a lot of summer camps and daycares simply could not operate. So even though the state came out with guidelines and said, you can reopen, the guidelines are um, so strict um, in terms of youth having to be six feet away from each other, wearing a mask, um, ratios being one to 10 um, for teachers to the groups of students, which right then and there cuts the um, amount of revenue coming in by half, because it's usually one to 20, yet you still have to support the same number of staff. So when these uh, guidelines got rolled out, 16 of the 18 publicly supported uh, Boston Centers for Youth and Family summer camps said, we can't run this summer, which means youth would not be employed there this summer either. And so we had been anticipating that. We didn't know exactly where those regulations were gonna land, but that, that was the impetus for developing four different tracks to be able to fill in for those jobs. So it looks like we do have another question. Um, do these programs only include Boston or are there other kind of more regional areas included as well, like the South Shore? Yeah, so this um, evaluation that I've been doing is focused only on Boston and Boston residents age 14 to 24 who can apply for the program. There is a state program uh, called um, uh, YouthWorks and that does have smaller regional programs that operate throughout the state. So on the South Shore, the North Shore, Western Mass. Um, and some of the uh, state dollars go to support what happens in Boston as well. But those programs are, they're much smaller and they're a little bit of a different flavor in terms of the types of jobs that youth work in. There's also summer jobs programs in Chicago, New York, DC, um, LA, um, Richmond, Charlotte, and so what's been interesting is as we've done this work um, that's supported by William T. Grant, William T. Grant gave us um, additional rapid response funding to write several policy pieces uh, talking about not just the importance of youth development from the summer jobs program based on our research, but also what Boston was planning to do to pivot its program and share that learning with these other cities so that, um, you know, we nobody has to reinvent the wheel, right? You might not agree with these or you might not think these are the four best tracks, but there's probably something here for all cities to be able to draw on. Um, so we're sharing that as well as our implementation guide about how are you gonna onboard youth this summer, right? You can't get wet signatures for work permits. Um, you 
How are you going to pay youth this summer? A lot of them don't have bank accounts that you can simply do direct deposit with, so you have to use cash cards. Um, uh, how are you going to keep youth safe uh, in terms of public health? So, you know, there are a lot of jobs that are going uh, and that are in high demand right now in terms of grocery store jobs um, or Amazon warehouse jobs. And that was certainly on our mind as we uh, thought about possibilities for different tracks, but it was really felt that those are frontline jobs and that it would be unfair to offer those kinds of jobs to youth who are living in very vulnerable communities that have higher caseloads of COVID and have greater rates of underlying medical conditions. And so we just uh, wiped those jobs right off the table um, and developed something that could keep everybody safe this summer. Okay, and then um, our, oh, this is interesting. Okay, so are you going to be able to connect students effort level during the remote portion of the school year. So they're logging in um, the work that they were doing, or if there is a way to measure that, to their summer work in 2020, and then looking forward to school records um, in the future. That's a great question. I think, um, I think the answer is probably not. Um, and the reason why is uh, aside from BPS, I'm not sure how well tracked uh, remote learning was. So I can tell you from experience with my kids um, in the Reading Public School System, we had no such tracking that was going on. Uh, there, was, there were no synchronous classes. Everything was just Google Classroom. Everything was optional. And also the state um, policy was that all school work was optional. So even though BPS was keeping track of that um, and for very good reason, I. Do, I'm fairly sure that not other school districts were as diligent in terms of keeping track of that. Um, we, could, we can look at uh, effort during the summer. So that is something um, that always happens where the community-based organizations keep track of summer hours. And so whether we're gonna keep track of that as youth um, reporting their hours to their community-based organizations um, in order for pay, payroll to happen, um, or, for example, on the virtual internships, we can see, um, are youth logging in? Are they active uh, in working on their projects? Uh, how long do they stay logged in? What kind, you know, uh, are they late with their deadlines and things like that? So there is a possibility to capture effort that way, but I won't be able to link it back to the um, lack of effort um, from the prior year. That's an interesting thing to think about for the fall, though, um, whether or not schools will track that. Is there any correlation between students with experience in the program and then with long-term growth, so later in, at an older age? Um, I, the data you showed was from 2015, so now we're five years later. Is there any um, kind of expansion out into the future that has been done or seen? Yeah, so the furthest that we've gone with that right now is looking at um, high school graduation for the entire cohort. Um, so you could have been a rising freshman in 2015, which means you would have recently graduated um, and been one year out. We're just starting to look at um, the applications to college and also matriculation into college, and then we'll be tracking college completion um, with the data that we have from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education we're also looking at um, employment and wage outcomes for youth after graduation um, by cohort. So we had only a very small cohort before that we could follow um, of youth that had uh, completed high school um, and not gone on to college, but were working. Um, and now we have a larger cohort that we can follow for that. I can tell you um, some work that's been done in New York City that has looked at much longer term outcomes where they got um, uh, criminal justice data and um, earnings data from and employment data from the IRS uh, that had looked at earlier cohorts and found um, a similar reduction in crime that uh, was represented by drops in incarceration. And that's like, you know, over a 20 year period. Um, and the same thing with improvements in um, employment and wages. Uh, it, that study showed that there was an improvement in employment wages, but that it did fade out over time. 
right? So it was initially helpful when entering the labor market, but that um, eventually the control group catches up, which um, you might think makes the program seem less effective, but if my kid were employed a couple of years earlier and earning a higher wage a few years earlier, right? Like those things are cumulative over time. So you might think even the timing of it um, could be impactful. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so a big thank you um, to Professor Modestino for, for sharing your research um, and for the work that, that you are doing to help our community here in Boston. Um, and I just want to note that this is the first in a three-part professor series. So I hope um, any registrants and attendees um, have also looked at the others. If you are interested um, in attending, I, I hope to see you there. Um, this event was recorded, so you will be receiving a link to it if you choose to revisit it. And thank you again and have a great weekend.